Year Two, Part Ten. Uncle Horace did not prove hard to entertain. When he was not talking over old times with Dad or Uncle Tom or Judy, he was reading sentimental novels. The more sentimental, the better. When he had exhausted the Silverbush Library, he borrowed from the neighbors. But the book David Kirk lent him did not please him at all. They don't get married at the last, he grumbled. I don't care a hoot for a book where they don't get properly married, or hanged, at the least. These modern novels that leave everything unfinished annoy me, and the heroines are all too old. I don't like them a day over sixteen. But things are often unfinished in real life, said Pat, who had picked up the idea from David. All the more reason why they should come write in books, said Uncle Horace testily. Real life. We get enough real life living. I like fairy tales. I like a nice snug tidy ending in a book with all the loose ends tucked in. Judy's yarns never left things in the air. That's why she's always been such a corking success as a storyteller. Uncle Horace was no mean storyteller himself. When they could get him going, which wasn't always, around Judy's kitchen fire in the cool evenings, he would loosen up. They heard the tale of his being wrecked on the Magdalenes on his first voyage, of the shark crashing through the glass roof of his cabin and landing on the dinner table, of the ghost in the black dog that haunted one of his ships and forebode misfortune. "'Did you ever see it yourself?' asked David Kirk with a skeptical twist to his lips. Uncle Horace looked at him witheringly. "'Yes, once,' he said before the mutiny off Bombay. His listeners shivered. When Tilly Tuck and Judy told tales of seeing ghosts, nobody minded or believed it. But it was different with Uncle Horace some way. Still, David stuck to his guns. Sailors were always superstitious. You don't mean to say that you really believe in ghosts, Captain Gardner? Uncle Horace looked through David and far away. I believe what I see, sir. It may be that my eyes deceived me. Not everybody can see ghosts. It is a gift. A gift I wasn't dowered with, said Suzanne, a trifle too complacently. Uncle Horace demolished her with one of those rare looks of his. Suzanne afterwards told Pat that she felt as if that look had bored a hole clean through her and shown her to be hollow and empty. The next excitement was Amy's wedding, to which everyone at Silverbush and Swallowfield went through a pouring rain, except Judy and Mother. Uncle Horace would not go in the car. It transpired that he had never been in a car, and was determined he never would be. So he went with Uncle Tom in the Phaeton, and got well drenched for his prejudices. It rained all day, but Uncle Horace came back in high good humor. "'Thank goodness there's a bride or two left in the world yet,' he said, as he came dripping into the kitchen where Ray had been reached home before him, was describing to a greedy Judy how Amy's bridal veil of tulle was held to her head in the latest fashion by a triple strand of pearls, with white gardenias at the back. Judy didn't feel that what do you call em's could be so lucky as orange blossoms, but she knew without asking that the wedding feast would have been more fashionable than filling, and she had a little bite ready for everybody as they came in. Pat was, last of all, having lingered to help Aunt Jessie and Norma. She looked around at the bright, homely picture with satisfaction. It was dismal to start anywhere in rain, but to come home in rain was pleasant to step from cold and wet into warmth and welcome the only thing she missed was the cats since uncle horace's coming they had been religiously banished gentleman tom spent his leisure in the kitchen chamber tilly tuck kept a disgruntled bolden bed in the granary and squidunk was a patient prisoner in the church barn only when uncle horace was away were they allowed to sneak back into the kitchen but that night while everybody slumbered in the comfort of Silverbush, a poor, foot-sore, half-dead little cat came crawling up the lane. It was Popka, cold, tired, hungry, on the last lap of his hundred-mile journey from East Point. 
When he reached the well-remembered doorstone, he paused and tried to lick his wet fur into some semblance of decency before meowing faintly and pitifully for admittance. But the door of Silverbush remained cruelly closed. Not even Judy in the kitchen chamber heard that feeble cry. Poor Popka dragged himself around to the back, and there discovered the broken pane in the cellar window which Judy had been lamenting for a week. In the kitchen he found a saucer of milk under the table, which an overstuffed Boldenbad had left when Judy had smuggled him in for his supper. Heartened by this, Popka looked happily about him. It was home. The kitchen was warm and cozy. There were several inviting cushions, but Popka craved the comfort of contact with some of his human friends. On four weary legs he climbed the stairs. Alas, every door but one was closed to him. The door of the poet's room was half open. Popka slipped in. Ah, there was companionship. Popka jumped on the bed. Pat, going downstairs before anyone else, saw a sight through the door of the poet's room that both horrified and delighted her. Popka, her dear lamented Popka, was curled into a placid vibrant ball on Uncle Horace's stomach. Pat slipped in, gently lifted Popka, and gently departed, leaving Uncle Horace apparently undisturbed. But when Uncle Horace came down to breakfast, his first words were, "'Who came in and took my cat?' "'I did,' confessed Pat. "'I thought you hated cats.' "'Used to,' said Uncle Horace. "'Couldn't bear em years ago. Wiser now. Found out they made life worth living. Been wondering why you didn't have any round. Used to be too much cat here, if anything.' Missed him. Tell you tonight how I came to make friends with the tribe. That night around the kitchen fire, while Popka purred on his knee and Boldenbad winked at him from the lounge, Uncle Horace told of the mystery of the black cat with the bows of ribbon in its ears. It was the last voyage I made on this side of the world. We sailed from Halifax for China, and the first mate had his young brother with him, a lad of seventeen. He'd fetched his favorite cat along with him. Pills was his name. The cats, I mean, not the boys. The boy's name was Geordie. Pills was black, the blackest thing you ever saw, with one white shoe, and cute as a pet fox. Both the cat's ears had been punched, and he was togged out with little bows of red ribbon tied in him. That proud he was of them, too. Once, when Geordie took them out to put fresh ones in and didn't do it for a day, Pills just sulked till he had his ribbons back. Everyone on board made a pet of him, except Cannibal Jim. Cannibal Jim? Why was he called that? asked Ray. Uncle Horace frowned at her. He did not like interruptions. Don't know, miss. Never asked him. It was his own business. I never liked cats before myself, but I couldn't help liking Pills. I just got as fond of him as the others, and felt as tickled as could be when he favoured me by coming to sleep in my cabin at night. T'wasn't everybody he'd sleep with, no sir. That cat picked his bedfellows. There were only three people he'd sleep with, Geordie, and me, and the cook. Turn and turn about, he never got mixed up. One night the cook took him when it was my turn, but that cat threw fits till the cook let him go and in less than a minute he was kneading his paws on my stomach. Next night was the cook's regular turn, but Pills punished him by acting up again and went and slept in a coil of rope on deck. He wouldn't sleep with Geordie, or me, out of our turn, but the cook had to be dealt with. Well, right in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Pills disappeared. Clean disappeared. We kept hoping for days he'd turn up, but he never did. I had hard work to keep the crew from mobbing Cannibal Jim for everyone believed he'd thrown pills overboard, though he swore till all was blue he'd never touched him. And now for the part you won't believe. Six months later that cat walks into his own old home in Halifax and curled up on his own special cushion. That's a fact. Explain it as you like. He was mighty thin and his feet were bleeding, but Geordie's mother knew him at once by the bows in his ears. She took it into her head that the ship was lost and that somehow the cat had survived and got home. She nearly went crazy till she found out different. I went to see Pills when I got back and he knew me right off, draped himself around my legs and purred like mad. 
There wasn't any doubt in the world that it was Pills. But Uncle Horace, how could he have got home? Well, the only explanation I could figure out was this. The day before we missed Pills, we'd been hailed by another ship, the Alice Lee bound for Boston, USA. They had sickness on board and had run out of some drug, I forget what, and the captain wanted to know if we could let him have some. We could, so he sent a boat across with it, two men in it. I concluded that one of them swiped the cat. Afterwards, Geordie recalled that Pills had been sitting perkly and impudently on a coil of rope as the men came over the side. He was never seen again, but he wasn't missed till the next day. It was Geordie's turn for him that night, but Geordie thought the cook had him, and being sorry for Cook, who was looking like a lopsided squirrel with a toothache, made no fuss. He didn't get worried till the next afternoon. The men all maintained that no sailor would ever steal another ship's cat, especially a black one, and blamed Cannibal Jim, as I've said. But I never believed even Cannibal Jim would play fast and loose with luck that way. We certainly had nothing but squalls and typhoons for the rest of the voyage, and finally a man overboard. But the most puzzling thing was that Pills took six months to get home. I went west that year and took to voyaging the Pacific, so I never fell in with any of the Alice Lee's crew again, but I did find out that she got to Boston two months after she'd passed us. Suppose Pills was on her. That left four months to be accounted for. Where was he? I'll tell you where he was, traveling the miles between Boston and Halifax on his own black legs. Tilly Tuck snorted incredulously. Either that or he swum it, said Uncle Horace sternly. I find it easier to believe he walked. Don't ask me how he knew the road. I tell you what I saw, then and there, that cats had forgotten more than human beings ever knew, and I made up my mind to cultivate their society. When this little fellow hopped on me last night, I just told him to pick out a soft spot on my old carcass and snuggle down. By the time Uncle Horace's visit drew near its close, they had all decided that they liked him tremendously, even if he did disapprove of their clothes, and avert his eyes in horror from the pale green and pink and orchid silk panties on the line Monday mornings. They thought, too, that Uncle Horace liked them, though they couldn't feel sure of it. Pat was sure, however, that he must approve of Silverbush. Everything went smoothly until the very last day, and it was really dreadful. In the first place, Sid upset Judy's bowl of breakfast pancakes batter on the floor and Winnie's baby crawled into it. Of course, Uncle Horace had to appear at the very worst moment before the baby could be even be picked up, and probably thought that was how they amused babies at Silverbush. Then Ray put an unopened can of peas on the stove to heat for dinner. The can exploded with a bang. The kitchen was full of steam and particles of peas, and Uncle Horace got a burn on the cheek where the can struck him. To crown all, Ray dared him to go up to Silverbridge in the car with her after supper, and Uncle Horace, though he had never been in a car, vowed no girl should stump him and got in. Nobody knew what went wrong. Ray was considered a good driver, but the car, instead of going down the lane and dashed through the palling fence, struck the church barn and finished up against a tree. No harm was done except a bent bumper, and Ray and Uncle Horace proceeded on their way. Uncle Horace did not seem disturbed. He said when he came home he had supposed it was just Ray's way of starting, and he thought he'd get a car of his own when he went back to the coast. Sure, and some of ye must have seen a fairy with all the bad luck we've had today, gasped Judy when he was safely off to bed. Today simply hasn't happened. I cut it out of the week, said Pat ruefully. After all our efforts to make a good impression, but did you ever see anything funnier than his expression when that can hit him? Yes, his expression when I sideswiped the church barn, said Ray. They both shrieked with laughter. I am afraid Uncle Horace will think we are all terrible, and you in particular, Ray. But Uncle Horace did not think so. That evening, he told Long Alec he wanted to pay the expenses of Ray's year at Queen's. She's a gallant girl, and easy on the eye, he said. I have neither chick nor child of my own. I like your girls, Alec, 
They can laugh when things go wrong, and I like that. Anyone can laugh when it's all smooth sailing. I'll not be east again, Alec, but I'm glad I came for once. It's been good to see old Judy again. Those plum tarts of hers with whipped cream. My stomach will never be the same again, but it was worth it. I'm glad you keep all, all the old traditions here. One does one's best, said Long Alec modestly. But Judy in the kitchen was shaking her grey bob sorrowfully at Gentleman Tom. Young Horace don't be young any longer. All the divilment has gone out of him, and looking so solemn. There was a time the solemner he looked the more mischief he was plotting. Oh, oh, Judy sighed. I'm fearing we do all be getting a bit old, cat dear. 